life is a cold and broken hallelujah but Paul writes to the church in Philippi and my text is Philippians 4 if you want to read it when you go home or if you want to pull it up on your phone or iPad now or if you want to open your Bibles I, I'm just going to refer to it You'll, and I'll give you some verses from time to time but I'm putting them on the screen I want you to feel the emotions of what's being said at this moment thinking about those words it's a cold and broken hallelujah for Paul writes and says to to the church in Philippi in verse 4 he says and I say to you rejoice in the Lord always how do you rejoice in the midst of sometimes what you see going on it is difficult but I believe we can always rejoice no matter what the situation is we can rejoice in the Lord we have a Jesus that so loves us that he saves us he touches us he never deserts us he never gives up to us and knowing that knowing that we belong to Jesus there is a peace a peace as we just sang in one of the kids songs a peace that passes understanding and that's the thought that comes out in this chapter 4 a peace that we can feel a peace that we can experience a peace that we can even begin to grasp to some degree to Christians in the ancient city of Philippi they were taught not to obsess over what was happening have on the screen don't worry about anything you'll have peace I know that's hard but we need to come to grips with the what Jesus is trying to teach us and to say to us and get us to understand in our culture we obsess about winners and losers Jesus never did that and he never taught us that he taught us something totally different you see our joy is not in winning or losing our joy is in Jesus our joy is about accepting Jesus it's about behaving as Jesus behaving in a way that respects this Jesus that we love being a group of believers and meeting together it's about respecting Jesus why do communion because it respects honors and remembers Jesus why think about Jesus because he is the ultimate in our lives when these words appear in verse 4 of that text rejoice in the Lord always what we're being told is we shouldn't be worrying about anything and everything that goes on I don't know sometimes if we grasp that especially in this period of time I see a lot of stress I see a lot of difficulties that people face but we stress about everything we just went through a great world series what a tremendous baseball way to end baseball season two teams and you, you wanted either one to win it was just great to watch that but how much stress was there people coming out and saying well I know they're predestined to win and you begin to think about it are they saying that God is so concerned about a World Series that he is going to to predestine determine that team in a presidential election the stress level is everything I can read and see just blows my mind and you begin to think about that for a moment in verse 6 and 7 of this text you find these words but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus the peace of God 
I go to God. And he doesn't say, okay, here's all the answers. He says, but I let know everything that's on my heart and mind. And I present it to my God. And presenting it to my God, there's a peace that he gives to us. Which passes our understanding. That guards our hearts and our minds. As Christians, I think most of us have come to realize that we have our wants. But we also understand that God, as a good parent, as a good leader, as a good shepherd, as a good caregiver, isn't so concerned with our wants, even though he always listens, is more concerned about what we really need in life. Every good care provider does what? Cares for the person. The person may want something, but what's best? And, and throughout this chapter, the Christians in Philippi are being told, you're being given what you need by God. What is it that I need more than anything else? It's peace. I had to go through this sermon four or five times because I wanted to do it with a calmness about it. Because it's easy for me to get excited and put everything I have into a message and get to a decimal that I don't want to be at today. I want you to hear what is being said about peace. The peace of God, a total sense of well-being that links our hearts and our minds to the Jesus who walked out of a grave and said, death no longer counts and sin is removed. That's an awesome thought. And it helps us to get through life. It's a great gift when you're struggling in school. It's a great gift when you're feeling miserable at work and you're tired of that job. It's a great gift when the relationships around you are failing. It's a great gift when you feel the the deep anxieties and the deep depression that so easily comes in our culture. It's a great gift to know that God says, I will move within you to give you peace in the midst of all your struggles. That I will be present. And it will be difficult for you to see because everything around you shouts stress, turmoil, Everything about around us agitates. And very simply put, the prince of this earth is evil and doesn't want you to know the peace of God. You see, we are challenged to place a focus on the Lord and receive his peace. And sometimes that focus is hard to have. We stress about wins and losses, but life is not about wins and losses. That's what the culture teaches us. That's what the culture wants you to hear. Too often, we look at the ecclesia, and, and I love that term, because this word church is that we translate out of the, the word that Jesus said when, he's, when he said, I will build my ecclesia, we come up with this word church. And uh, as I understand the very basics of the language of Jesus' day, he was talking about a group of people. He said, I'm going to build people together. I will bring them together in such a way that they will make a difference in this world. But too often we look at the church as a team, not as a gathering of siblings together who have the same parent. In a season of political activity we're more concerned I think sometimes about you know are you liberal or are you conservative are you of a political party uh, we're more concerned about those things instead of realizing that we have a God at work we spend time and we spend energy debating who's going to win who's going to lose we wonder 
who's in, who's out, who's on top, who's on the bottom. And we spend most of our time with such things as that. You know, a lot of ink is being spilled, or especially over these last umpteen months about winning and losing. Does Jesus really care about who wins a popularity contest? Does he really care who wins a World Series? Who's the most popular when it comes to a political contest? If you think about verse 5 of this text for just a moment, verse 5 teaches we are to have an attitude and a practice of gentleness towards all. Now, I know we're talking about peace, but there is a spirit and an attitude that comes. Because see, it's verse 4 that says rejoice always. And again, I say rejoice. Verse 5 says we are to have a spirit of gentleness. This rejoicing in us enables us when we rejoice in our Lord to understand that there is a spirit of gentleness that we are to maintain often we do focus on winners and losers we reflect on the struggles and talk about all the political struggles that go on we talk about being conservative or liberal but think a moment as Christians what is our opportunity what is our challenge I am to rejoice in the Lord always there is to be a spirit of gentleness about me. And there is a peace that comes from God because I choose to follow Jesus. So it brings me to an understanding. We are to express a moral clarity and we are to stress God's love for those around us. In the midst of all that's happening, there is a moral clarity, and it's Jesus. I'm intrigued at times when you, we talk about truth, and Jesus sums up truth by saying, I am the truth. It's not a doctrine. It's not a philosophy. It's not a religion. It's not a political view. Truth is Jesus and all that he's about. He brings a moral clarity if we'll stop for a moment and pay attention. And in the midst of that moral clarity, our Lord is stressing to us that God's love is for all, even those who are oppressed. And all of a sudden, it's like the, you raise the blinds and let the sunlight in. In this case, you let the Son of God in. In our cultural win and loss approach to life, critical points of view are lost when we begin to judge someone else as a winner or loser. Too often, in a win philosophy, you end up coming in with an inward looking and an egotistical attitude. I'm number one, and I'm better than you. Because of winning and losing con consuming so much of our thinking, the moral compass is being lost. And we're not seeing this one who is truth, which is Jesus. We've lost so often in our national view of things We have lost something about the ecclesia, this thing that Jesus said, I will build. We've lost that it is a meeting place of all people. It is a place where in the midst of stress I can come and not only receive comfort, but also sometimes receive a listening ear. In the midst of great debate, it's a place to come 
where there's a quietness of spirit because of the peace that rules within us, there is a quietness that allows us to do what? To follow that moral compass that's found in Jesus. And sometimes there's disagreements. So be it. But we're brought together in a unique way. This is an excellent place, this group of believers together, to wrestle with the most difficult, the most hard perspectives of life. It's a place where we can learn. It's a place where discussions should be very fruitful, where we get to make a commitment to each other in a spirit of gentleness we come for that's who we are as Jesus had a spirit of gentleness you know on the on the cross he he cries out God forgive them what a beautiful spirit in the words of the song that I sang talked about drawing a gun and shooting Violence exists around us. And the gentleness that we're told to have isn't always there. Now here's what I want you, if you're not following where I'm going with this, verse 1 of chapter 4, and, and this is a letter, and I hate to put the verses and chapters into it because it really disturbs me how this, this letter flows. It's, it's someone writing to a group of Christians and saying to them, I love you and I care about you. And, and it, all of a sudden in verse 2, he writes, you got a couple of Christians there that love the Lord, that serve, work, and do everything they can for the Lord. But they're at odds with each other. Verse 3, he, he talks about another Christian stepping in to help. But he, he doesn't say, you're right and you're wrong, when he addresses these two Christians in this chapter. And again, you're going to have to read the text, and you're going to have to struggle with it. But the unique part, he says, and this is as he continues to, to talk to them, he says, I want these two Christians to be of the same mind. Now I know, depending on where you come in the theological circles of your background, most people say same mind means you have to think alike. That's not what he's saying there. What he is saying is it is possible to be of the same mind because you're in the Lord. What is it that we hold common? It is Jesus. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. Each of us are at a different place in life. Each of us have been motivated by different things. In this audience, each of you have had things happen in your life that produces different effects on you that no one else has experienced. And sometimes what we do with this win-loss, this being number one, this being the better of anyone else, being the greatest of everyone else, all of a sudden we fail to comprehend that being of the same mind is about keeping our focus on the Lord and not on the position that I have. And that is not a popular teaching, is it? It's really not. But that's what he's saying in this text when you think about the implications. The challenge of the Christian community is to take each other serious. Don't write each other off. Don't make fun of each other. Don't bully each other. Don't put each other down. It's with the spirit of gentleness that we work. Jesus came in this world to change things. For the last several years, there's been different movements that have come along, and one movement comes up and says, you can't be a change agent. Jesus came to change us, 
to give to us a different spirit, a spirit of gentleness. He came to give us a peace of mind and heart so that we could live together even in the midst of disagreement. It's so different when you think about what Jesus came to do. Jesus had no interest in so much of the everyday things that separated. There were times where people came to Jesus and they had little squabbles and he would say, it's not worth discussing. Here's what's important. Paul had no, no interest in taking sides here in this chapter 4 of the two Christians who are at odds with each other. So what he writes to them, and this is down in verse 8, and this is the key, folks. Everybody writes a book about here's the 10 steps, here's your 3 steps. You know, here's the plan. How do I be that person of peace? How do I have this concept of Jesus in my life? Verse 8, he writes, Finally, always think about what is true. Think about what is noble, right, and pure. Think about what is lovely and worthy of respect. If anything is excellent, if anything is worthy of praise, think about those things. You see, we are challenged by the very Spirit of God to focus on whatever is true, honorable, and just. And it doesn't matter from where it comes, right, left, whatever you want to call it, it doesn't matter from where it comes. We are to celebrate what is pure, what is pleasing, what is commendable. It's not whether contest or won or lost. It's about rejoicing in what is excellent, worthy of praise. Not whether we win or lose under the standards of this culture, but it's about standing firm in Jesus, not in a political party, team, or tradition. It's about standing firm in Jesus. Our challenge is to be Christ-like in this life. World championships, presidential elections, otherworldly prizes, they, they really had no significance to the Savior who emptied himself, humbled himself, and became obedient to the point of death. That's in chapter 2, verse 8 of this letter to the church in Philippi. You see, God raised Jesus from the dead and highly exalted him so that we could all be saved and we could be together. Differences, oh yeah, there will always be differences. But what is it that we hold sacred? It's Jesus and being like Jesus. Any lasting achievement is going to come from living in ways that are true, honorable, just, pure, pleasing, commendable, excellent, and worthy of praise. At the end of this section of Scripture, Paul says, keep on doing what you have learned, and the God of peace will be with you. The God of peace is with you no matter if you win or lose, or whether you have to wait 100 years for a world championship. God of peace will be with you come Wednesday when the presidential election is over. God's still in charge. Amen. Our Lord is still Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Jesus is still challenging us to live in a spirit of gentleness coming out of the peace that we have been given so that we can touch lives in the most honorable in decent way and none of that has been seen in this election right. and it is a shame so what is the voice that speaks out at a moment like this it has to be you and me you see we belong to a Lord that calls us to have a gentleness of spirit coming out of the peacefulness that we know 
from a God who says, I will always be with you and I will never desert you. The triumphs in sports, the triumphs in politics really don't matter in the scheme of things. For it is our Lord that we honor. And it is he that I bow down before, that I stand in awe of. I rejoice in the Lord always, saying to him, let your peace come, O Lord. Let's bow. Father, in this text are so many wonderful thoughts to remind us in the midst of cultural wars, in the midst of political conflicts, in the midst of much oppression and destruction in this world. And we look around and, and Satan wants our focus to be off of Jesus. But we come this day to renew ourselves. Yes, Lord, it is you, Jesus, and only you. It is you, O oh Lord, that we celebrate. You take, you've continued to take away our sins and cleanse us and purify us so that we can live like you, so that we can be a people that not only love our wonderful creator, but we love each other and understand that we all come from the one, that we're all siblings in this life and that you've called us to a life of peace that's demonstrated in the kindness that we give to each other. Help whatever's going to happen in this election. Bless what is going to happen. Use us to be the voice, to be the example of what it means to live peacefully with a spirit of gentleness. For we are called to be your servants in your will no matter what I think or what we think as a group. It is your will that is beyond us all and it is your will that will be carried out. We want to answer that call just to serve, just to be a people making a difference. Thank you, Father, for using us Thank you for the peace that passes understanding that fills us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In the blessed name of Jesus. Amen.